lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here with Liberty Larry, who's dancing to the tune that I cannot hear. <laughs> dancing to the music, man. Like, I can hear it in my head. All right. <laughs> Yeah, we got we got a snazzy intro, man. I like it. <laughs> All right, sweet. <laughs> I I do want to point out that you cannot hear the guitar music while we're actually sitting here recording. I yeah, layer okay, that I can, in later. I can hear it in my <laughs> head though. Like I say, I'm right. jamming out over here. Maybe it's this amazing cocktail I'm drinking. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm actually kind of running low on the homemade grenadine. I'll have to make some more soon. Ah, well, gotta get on that. But I, I got some new tequila. Ah, we can we can have the Mexican firing squad with new tequila. Mm-hmm. That sounds fun. Well, we're having it with new tequila. Oh, is this the new tequila? Yeah. This oh, is the okay. Point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah okay. The, that was the point of buying it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I was down to just like a very little bit of reposado, and the um, the recipe actually calls specifically for reposado. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah. I only had a uh, añejo. Oh yeah. Which. Honestly, I don't think it makes that much of a difference, but no. But I, I was trying to be true to the true to the cocktail, yeah, right? True to the recipe. Yeah. And um, and I bought a bunch of limes the other day. Yeah. So. And they almost rang them up. I bought three limes. I guess that's not a bunch of limes, but it's a bunch of limes for like one person living by themselves. <laughs> yeah. Um. And uh, they accidentally rang it up originally as three hundred. Who? They fixed it. <laughs> Imagine and I was like, did. yeah, I'm not, I'm not making that many cocktails. <laughs> right. They'll go bad before I go through all of those. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm up for the challenge. <laughs> but. <laughs> yeah. I have been drinking a little, quite a bit recently, so uh, we're going to cut that out of the podcast. Nobody ha- needs to know that. It happens to the best of us. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've, um, I've gotten like probably less than six hours of sleep in like the last four days. Yeah. And like three of them were after um, our Tuesday night dinner. And drinks. Yeah, because I, I drank like, uh, I don't know, I had a quarter of a bottle of 109 proof whiskey or whatever. <laughs> yeah. So that wasn't even really sleep. Yeah. That was just being unconscious That's for a just, few hours. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and yeah. then I woke up. Um, so I'm kind of running on fumes here. Yeah. I feel you on that one. It's been a long day. So. Yeah. Uh, long week. So, you know, the the 300 limes worth of cocktails. Could have been valuable to you. Yeah, might be. I'd be <laughs> unconscious that much more. <laughs> <All> right. <laughs> and, you know, tequila is pretty low proof compared to what I usually drink. So. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> <laughs> tequila is like the lowest proof thing that I drink. Yeah. Um, you know, gin's... Jen's up there usually. Yeah. 110, 114. Yeah. Um, most of the whiskey I drink is up there like 110 ish. Oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, tequila is the only one down there at 80. Although I do drink brandy as a nightcap with some regularity. That's uh, 80 proof. And is that 80 proof? Okay. Yeah. Well, there you go. So I'm, you know, I'm keeping, I'm keeping it under control, you see. <laughs> yeah, right. As you can see, there's no problems here. <laughs> no problem at all. Uh, Everything is good. Somebody's calling it an intervention right now. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, um, I wanted to start with uh, just revisiting some things that I don't know if they were clear. Well, I'm pretty sure that they weren't clear. Um, some potential uh, problems with our analysis or um anyway well just to jump we didn't, we right didn't make it. we didn't make some things clear so i can imagine some of you out there thinking well i don't understand that you were um opposed to the to the government restricting discrimination for a business but you were not opposed to the government restricting discrimination for uh college yeah. admissions yeah like why would that be What's the difference? Yeah. You know, if you're, if you're saying that you want less government involvement, shouldn't the, these private university now UNC isn't a private university, but, um, I don't know that Harvard is either. I think it is though. I don't know. We're going to assume that Harvard is a private university for the purposes of this discussion. If to, if if for no other reason than illustrate the point. Yeah. So why would you be opposed to a private business 
a private university discriminating yeah. if you're okay with a private business discriminating? That would be the, the logical question there. Yeah. Um, and the answer is actually the public versus private question. And it, it's why I noted in the last podcast that there are only like 12 schools that don't take federal money. Yeah. Out of the fourth, roughly 4,000 colleges and universities in the U S is because even private schools are largely funded with federal dollars. Yeah. Um, through grants and loans and, and other kinds of stipends or endowments or whatever they want to call them. Yeah. Um, so I think the point that, that I'd like to make on this is that the private business is, first off, the private business is subject to market forces. So um, they make an individual decision and the market can decide if, whether or not to punish them for that. Yeah. The, um, the government lies outside of the market. Yeah. As the creator of, of currency. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, and so if uh, a significant portion of of even a private enterprise is funded by federal money. Like, you know, technically speaking, Lockheed Martin is a private company. Yeah, but if you pull the pull the federal money out, like that they have company, almost nothing left. That, that company folds in a month. <laughs> right. Um, so it's not really a business. It's not really a private business. Yeah. If it functions solely, almost solely, it's like ninety six percent of their revenue is government contracts. Well, yeah. Um, something like that. And there's a bunch of other companies out there. So these are not companies that are subject to market forces because their money comes from the government Yeah. and the government functions outside of the market. And so uh, the point, I guess I'm trying to get to here, um, is that the goal or the thing that you absolutely have to prevent is anything that can be, um, considered, uh, government sponsored discrimination. Yeah. Right. Because the government doesn't have to respond to market forces. Yeah. It, you know, you can punish a business for discrimination if you want. You can't punish the government for it. Yeah. So except at the ballot box. <laughs> which is like the weakest argument there is like this. <laughs> you want to get into the democracy thing here? <laughs> I don't know about all that. But. No, me neither. But uh I mean, just to suffice to say that you have very little control over what your government does. Yeah. Um, I remember I was hearing somebody, I think it was uh, Constantine uh, Kissin or whatever, the guy from Trigonometry, uh, debating Dave Smith about the Ukraine war. And um, Constantine said something about that, uh, you know, that something about democracy and uh, support for the Ukraine war. Yeah, he, he did. He made the comment about like, you can fight it at the ballot box or yeah, something yeah. like that, which is like, I was like, I, just I haven't insane. gotten to vote about it yet. I yeah, mean, I, exactly. <laughs> I haven't gotten to vote about any of the money. Um, I haven't, you know, the truth is I haven't even really been able to punish anybody that's voting for the money. Yeah, exactly. So it seems to me that you, you only actually get the, ability to vote about things that don't matter. Yeah. And the things that really do matter, there's never a vote taken on. And yeah. actually most of the policies would continue regardless. Like you can move all those all those elected representatives yeah. out of there. Doesn't matter. There's the permanent bureaucracy back there making those decisions and pushing all that stuff down the line anyway. Yeah. And there's nothing you can do about them. Like they're just they're entrenched in our system now. Yeah. Two things I'll say real quick about democracy. All right. One of them is that, like, if you really step back and you look at it on a on a large scale, at least, you know, if you're talking about federal or even state level, yeah, democracy is just a control mechanism. Mm -hmm. It becomes an excuse for whatever policies are going on. You say, well, you know, it, the majority wanted this. Yeah. And second, for those of you on the left who feel that minority rights and, you know, minority oppression is something that must be fought and minority rights are something that's really important. What is democracy? I mean, yeah. just, just like stop and think about that for just a second. Yeah. Like no matter how you identify, like if you're only identifying particular features as, um, as representing a minority, if you're talking about race or religion or whatever as the minority, the truth is that what democracy does is it allows the majority to oppress the minority. Yeah. 
every time. <laughs> like that's that's what it is. Yeah, that that's exactly its function. Yeah. Um. So the idea that somehow by something being voted on makes it a moral good is just fallacious. Oh yeah. Um. But we'll move past that. <laughs> hey, I, yeah. My bad for pulling us down yeah. the little trail here. <laughs> um. The other thing is that, uh, you know, I can hear the argument in response to that, um, that, well, what about the, you know, you say if you got to allow these people to, uh, you know, to succeed or fail on their own merits, but, um, you know, there's a bunch of, especially, you know, like inner city blacks or rural black schools, uh, they come in with a disadvantage because there's poor quality schools in those areas and so on. Yeah. That's a perfectly valid argument, by the oh, way. Oh, yeah. Um, but the answer isn't to lower standards to let them into elite universities. The answer is to fix the problem earlier on. Um, and so then we come back around to the things that I was advocating so strongly when I was running for uh, Board of Education here, um, which is things like allowing school choice. Yep. Um, you know, creating more of a competition within the, the public school system. Yeah. Uh, of course, you know, school choice, voucher system, any kind of thing that allows students to move around uh, more easily and go to a better school if and, that's what they want. Well, and go to the best school in their area. Yeah. As and, long as they can get there. Right. And and you want to incentivize the schools to provide a better education to draw more students in. Well, exactly. Uh, because the incentives are all backwards in public schools now. Like the poorer they perform, the more they get. Yeah, exactly. And that may seem reasonable on the surface, like, okay, well, if they're performing badly, obviously they just need more resources to bring it up. But that's not how it works. It just creates a negative feedback loop. Yep. It creates an incentive to continue to perform poorly to so get you continue those getting the funding. Exactly. Um, so that's, you know, I, that's where I think that you solve that problem. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I just wanted to address that to, to address what probably on the surface seems like a contradiction. Yeah. Yeah. In, when you mentioned analysis. that the other day, I was, I, I didn't think about it as the podcast went on, but yeah, there's definitely a contradiction there that needed to be clarified. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, you know, I want to make sure that you all realize how consistent we are. <laughs> <laughs> we try. <laughs> um, and, and that actually comes around to the thing I said, like that was poorly worded when I said, I, you know, I believe in, in protected classes. Yeah. Um, in terms of protecting classes from the government is, is that you just want to make sure that you don't set up a system which, which is government sponsored discrimination. Yeah, absolutely. Based on inequality. Yeah. Um, okay. So like a quick one and then we move into something a little bit more serious, I think. All right. Um, so I just wanted to point out that, um, that Turkey was resistant to, uh, letting Sweden into NATO. And NATO is an organization that requires um, absolute consensus to bring somebody else in. It has to be unanimous. Every yeah. member nation has to say yes to yeah. invite a new nation in. And Turkey was a holdout uh, yeah. on Sweden. And um, Turkey announced the other day that they had reversed their position and they were going to vote yes on Sweden, which, which will bring Sweden into NATO. Yeah. And on the following day, the U.S. announced um, a new deal with Turkey f to provide them with F-16s. Yeah. <laughs> Coincidence? <laughs> Claiming it was totally unrelated to their decision to allow Sweden into NATO. But um, I should have gone and pulled clips, but I, I just wrote this down right before we started the podcast, so I didn't get a chance to go back and pull it. But um, when the question about Sweden joining NATO first came up and Turkey was resistant, uh, Biden and I think Blinken as well, um, both said something about, well, we know that Turkey wants F-16s and we think that we can work some things out. Yeah. So they both explicitly said that they were going to bribe <laughs> Turkey with F-16s, with a deal for F-16s to get them to vote for Sweden to enter NATO. Um, then Turkey voted for Sweden to enter NATO and the U.S. announced on the following day that they were providing F-16 contracts, but it was unrelated just makes you wonder why more of these countries don't be the holdout yeah like, why not like get some free stuff like why not like um i've always wondered that with just in congress in general too why some of these um republicans on the republican and democrat side some of these senators senators and congressmen don't just like especially when the majorities are thin just be that holdout 
and get just as many concessions as you mm-hmm. ca- can, you know? Yeah. Um, like, there's a lot of power in being that guy that's like, nah, I'm not going on this one, guys. Well, that's what a lot of people in in the new, um, the new base of the Libertarian Party, people like Scott Horton and, and so forth, have been advocating, yeah. is that in those cl- races that are close, where the Libertarian's the spoiler, yeah. that we use that leverage yeah. to get concessions from one party or the other and then throw our support behind whichever side we get the concessions and from. And I think there's something to that. Like, yeah. I mean, And it's funny because just kind of LP politics for a second, but there's mm-hmm. a lot of resistance to that. Like, there's a lot of Libertarians that don't agree with that philosophy. Yeah. And to me, that's just like we got to wield our power where we can. Like we don't mm-hmm. have much. Like, And, you know, the right we're going, we may never have a lot. But... <laughs> You know, I mean, use I it know. use it where you can. Like, I mean, if that that could seriously make a difference to mm. liberty in areas, you yeah. know. Yeah, like, you're using it to promote liberty. I, I don't see that it's a, a a compromise of principles. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, as long as the results are imp- are an increase in liberty, then you've done it right. Not yeah. to say the ends justifies the means. I don't. Yeah. Believe that, but. No. Like, I think it has to be moral all the way through to be moral. Yeah. <laughs> like, all steps must be moral for the, you know, for the action to be moral. But, um, but that's not, you know, that's a, certainly a situation there where you're using what leverage you have to improve situations for some people. And I don't think that that's a compromise no. of, of morality or principles. Absolutely. Um, so also related to NATO, uh, they had the conference in Vilnius this week. Yeah. Um, uh, Vladimir Zelensky was unhappy. <laughs> he he pitched a fit for a couple of days. Yeah, he didn't get what he wanted. No. Um, I, I you told me he he his rhetoric has softened. He's backed uh, off since the end of the conference here, but but he was pretty hard line for a couple of days there, mm-hmm. really giving particularly the U.S. a hard time. Yeah, I I think that he needs to lay off the blow a little bit, <laughs> let that ego deflate just a little. Yeah. Um, I I think that that's probably why he's softened the rhetoric. Actually, I I, I know. I can't remember who it was, but somebody called him out and and yeah. said, you know, like a little bit of gratitude would be nice here. Yeah. Like I, you know, we've been backing their war all this time. And like, I came to meet with them and, uh, I got met with a list. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, like, Hey, well, it is crazy to me, like watching the coverage this week of some of that, like mm-hmm. in his mind, I say in his mind, I mean, in the mind of the Ukrainians, they, they think they're defending Europe against Russia. Like, that's what their position is, is like, if we don't stop them here, they're going to take over Europe. Yeah. Um, And it it amazes me. Like, I mean, the people that listen to this podcast know where the lie is in that. Like, I hope so. I I, I was thinking about this the other day, too, is that I, I have come across so many people who somehow simultaneously hold these two thoughts in their head at the same time. Yeah. The one being that, if we don't stop Russia and Ukraine, then they're going to tear through Europe and take over all of Europe. Yeah. And we can stop Russia and Ukraine. Yeah. Now, if Russia has the power to tear through and, and conquer all of Europe, yeah, we can't stop them in Ukraine. <laughs> yeah. And if we can stop them in Ukraine... Then that was never going to happen. Then they don't have the power to go <laughs> through all of Europe. It was never going to happen. So, so yeah, there's that, but there's also just a it, just complete ignoring of history to mm-hmm. to hold that belief to think yeah. that that what's happening here is is Putin's decided he's going to take over Europe and here mm-hmm. he goes. Yeah. When anybody who knows the history, like we've talked about so much on this podcast, knows that's not what his goals are, and that's not where his priorities are at. Mm-hmm. Um, he made it very clear, and he's made it very clear for more than a decade now, for 15 years roughly, he's made it clear that um, he doesn't want their um, trading partner and neighbor in an oppositional or a confrontational military alliance on his border. Yeah. which That's is, what it's all about. Which is fair. Yeah. Like, I mean, say what you will. Um, and, and the crazy thing, like I was thinking about this the other day, just listening to some of these, these, um, people talk about the conference and whatnot. Mm -hmm. It's like, when you really think about like, 
why do we, and I know Trump brought this up, but why do we need to be in NATO? Like, I mean, it, it is a world away from us. Mm -hmm. Like, it is. And I'm sure there was a time where you could make an argument for it during the Soviet Union. But... Well, I, I can tell you what the answer is now, or at least what I believe the answer is now. Yeah. Um, I, I, now, I believe that it, it is just a, uh, a forum through which we exercise um, authority over the nations of Europe. Yeah. Well, it is. Like, that's, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. Um, the problem is, is particularly like us as libertarians, like we just, this, this is doing nothing but bankrupting our country. Like, I mean, that's, that's what it's. I mean, NATO is not exactly the thing that's bankrupting our country. No, but, but it ain't helping. <laughs> I mean, it's contributing. That's true. Yeah. I mean, but um, this, but it goes back to what you were saying. Like, this is nothing but empire games. Yeah. Like, I mean, this is what empires do. It's just the militarism in general that's bankrupting the country. I mean, NATO is yeah. certainly a part of that, but I don't think it's a really large. Well, it, until Dollars, this conflict, it was yeah. not a large, uh, large part of it. Yeah. Um, I, I think. I think uh, you could argue that NATO since the '90s has been building up to this conflict, though. Oh yeah. Like I mean, this. I mean, this is this is it kind of coming to a head. Yeah, there are certainly plenty of people in the know that warned against NATO expansion after the fall of the Soviet Union. Yeah. Um, that Because it would lead to, where we're to a at. conflict with the remains of Russia. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they it's turned out that they were prescient in some ways. Yeah. But nobody was listening. Yeah. Um, I, I think the... Uh, I think an important... Um, Something important that came out of the Vilnius Con, uh, what do they call it? The, the NATO? Yeah, yeah. The, the, the conference? Conference. There yeah. we go. Okay. I don't know why I had trouble with that word. Because <laughs> yeah. I've had six hours of sleep in the last four days. <laughs> It's a contributing factor, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and my brain is like a sieve these days. It's just, yeah. not, you know, I'm, I'm losing a lot of vocabulary, I feel like. <laughs> but uh, Jens Stoltenberg said in no uncertain terms that uh, now, I mean, this it shouldn't need to be stated even because it's part of the the NATO agreement. But yeah. um, Jens Stoltenberg uh, stated in no uncertain terms that Ukraine would not become a part of NATO as long as the war with Russia continued. Yeah, yeah. I, um, well, actually, I think he said this is kind of worse in some ways, but um, I, I think he actually said that uh, that Ukraine could not become a part of NATO unless they win the war. Oh wow, wow! Which essentially define, means define that they will, win. Like, well, that's true. Um, I mean, yeah, we're we're not being real specific about what that means, but yeah. because he wasn't, I mean, who knows? I think is actually a way of him saying that Ukraine will never be a part of NATO. <laughs> well, there may be something to that. Um, well, and, I mean, it's written into the charter. They're not supposed to. You're not supposed to bring people in if they have conflict mm -hmm. in their country. Yeah. Which they've had conflict there since what? At least twenty fourteen. At least twenty fourteen. Yeah, I mean, I, maybe going back further. It's just crazy listening to some of the talking heads this week, and like your brain would just explode listening to some of these people. I promise. <laughs> um, but one one in particular, this person, and it's supposed to be some kind of expert, was talking about you know there there's a template for bringing NATO, bringing them into nato under these circumstances you know mm. and i'm just and she's like she's laying it out like you know you know we'll 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 vow to protect the the areas that ukraine currently controls and if you know they lose those areas we'll have to get involved and like all of the stuff i'm like you realize what you're flirting with here, right? Yeah, like, direct war with Russia. Direct, and it's like there's no acknowledgement of it at all. And she's just continuing to lay out this template that's like, this is just, these are crazy people talking. Well, <laughs> and I, I was listening to Douglas McGregor, and he was talking about the um, outrageous fantasy that you can have, uh, you can use tact tactical nuclear weapons without starting a nuclear war. Yeah. And he said, it's just an outrageous fantasy that like, yeah. for some reason, these guys in the Pentagon have this idea that, you know, we can use a tactical nuke. It's only like five kilotons. It'll only kill 30 or 40,000 people. Nobody will notice. <laughs> right. Like, <laughs> yeah, they'll just take that. Right. They they won't like send those our way. Yeah. Like. I mean, the problem is that especially this, this is another reason that I've 
advocated starting with getting rid of ICBMs yeah. in terms of like abolishing nuclear weapons, but yeah. starting with ICBMs because they're, they're stationary. Mm. They're sessile. They, and, and the thing is that once, once a nuke, then this is what he was pointing out is yeah. that even if you're using a tactical nuke, somebody uses a tactical nuke, then everybody fires all their missiles because yeah. if they don't use them, they'll lose them. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that's the danger of these like stationary, you know, ground missiles that they have yeah. when you don't need them anyway, you got bombers, you've got submarines like that are yeah. all mobile and hidden and, and you know, yeah. um, and there's not the same kind of concern that if you don't use it immediately that it'll be lost. Yeah. But anyway, um, his point was that, you know, you can't have a limited nuclear war. There's no such thing. It's an outrageous right. fantasy to think that that would ever happen. Once the first bomb goes off, all bets are off. Yeah, they all go. Um, for both sides. I mean, there's, yeah, it's... Let it's, them rip. Yeah, you have to. Like, yeah. Which is why it's a dangerous game. And that's the reason it just blows my mind that you have serious people out there talking about this type of... Just like it, like not even acknowledging the threat of this. I bet there's only okay. Just to try and put things in perspective here a little bit, um, I bet on the entire planet Earth, yeah, there's only a few hundred cities that have a hundred thousand or more people. Okay. Okay. I mean, I don't know how many there is, but I bet yeah. I bet it's like three, four hundred maybe. Yeah. Cities that on the entire globe that have over a hundred thousand population. Yeah. The U.S. and Russia each have roughly 6,000 thermonuclear warheads deployed. Yeah. Okay. I mean, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. So that's 12,000 thermonuclear warheads. If there's yeah. 400 cities out there. Then you can hit every single one of them with 30 thermonuclear weapons. <laughs> that's just insane. If my math is right, that I just did in my head, just and I did hope it is. Head, yeah. Um, I mean, you're talking about just it's at least leveling. three, but I think it's thirty. Yeah, like <laughs> no, it 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 doesn't make any sense, and it just like I say, it's it's really hard to watch the mainstream news and just listen to that kind of talk. Mm -hmm. Like it's it's very very frustrating. Well, and then speaking of ridiculous weaponry. Um, Biden has now approved the sale of cluster bombs to, or cluster munitions, I should yeah. say, cluster munitions to Ukraine. Now, the claim is that, well, Russia's been using them. Yeah. Well, and up until now, we've been claiming war crimes, that Russia is committing war crimes in Ukraine. And like, I mean, I've watched all kinds of little deals where they're like, well, we're collecting the evidence for after this is over. So we can prosecute Russia for war crimes, for using these weapons that no other country uses and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Well, there's like um, roughly, well, a little less than, I guess, um, two thirds of the nations on Earth have uh, signed a decree outlawing cluster munitions. Yeah. Russia, Ukraine, United States, none of us have signed it. Yeah. Um, although a lot of uh, uh, of uh, the U.S.'s close allies have signed it. Yeah. And um, as far as I could, like, I started trying to look into this, the claim that Russia's been using cluster munitions. Yeah. Um, well, there it's it's disputed. Like, Russia, actually, from at least from what I saw months ago, mm -hmm. they're claiming they're not. Yeah, well, from what I could tell, and I, it's certainly possible that I missed something here, but yeah. um, from what I could tell, the claim is based on a um, on a video. Yeah. Like on a single video that even the Pentagon declined to verify that it was evidence that Russia was using cluster munitions. Really? Yeah. yeah. Um, now, on the other side of the war... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Human Rights Watch, as well as some other organizations, um, have documented that Ukraine has been using cluster munitions. Yeah. Already. Yeah. Um, so it, I, I would say that the evidence that Ukraine has been using cluster munitions is stronger than the evidence that Russia has been using cluster munitions. Yeah. And of course, the reason that the U.S. is giving for uh, for uh, um, 
green lighting the sale of these is because they've run out of regular 155 millimeter howitzer shells. I was going to say, is it, is it because lack of um, munitions? Yeah. <laughs> they said, well, we've run out of the regular high explosive shells, so we're just going to give them cluster munitions to fill the gap while we ramp up production. <laughs> okay. So we can continue to just drubbleize this country. Yeah. Now, these things are terrible. By the way, they, yeah. you know, for those that aren't familiar with the concept, um, it's, uh, it's a 155 millimeter howitzer shell where the nose is filled with a whole bunch of sub munitions. Um, I think it's roughly, I, I can't remember it. Like the, the number varies, but I think it's like usually around 70 or so additional, like yeah. little grenades essentially, yeah. um, that are dispersed over a broad area. So the, it, like it, there's another charge that explodes above the ground. It spreads these smaller munitions over a wide area, and then they're supposed to all hit the ground and explode. And, and in our uh, case, all of them explode, right? Well, that's some interesting <laughs> stuff there. Yeah. Um, so the there is actually legislation uh, that's written to the Department of Defense Appropriations every year Yeah. that forbids the transfer sale of cluster munitions with greater than a 1% by the United States with yeah. greater than a 1% dud rate or ah, failure rate. Yeah. Now, um, the manufacturers of these munitions don't even claim a less than 1% oh, really? dud rate. The manufacturers yeah. claim two to 5%. Yeah. Um, the most recent Pentagon assessment of these munitions is over 20 years old. <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> or at least the most recent public. Yeah. Pentagon assessment is more than 20 years old. Yeah. Um, and it's a, it reports a 6% failure rate. Whew. And um, last year, a uh, congressional research uh, service assessment found that the dud rate was more like 10 to 30%. Wow. And the number that I keep seeing actually is like 14%. Really? Mm -hmm. Well, it's important to mention why this dud rate is important because when these things don't go off, they're, They'll go off eventually. Like if the right person finds it or stumbles upon it, hits it with their car, whatever the case may be, like it'll go off then. Yeah. Um, and a little the, kid decides to throw it. Well, and that's I was fixing to say, and that from at least the the stuff I've seen on it, like that's the most common thing to happen is a child finds it and it ends up going off. Yeah. Um, the uh, of course the Biden administration is ignoring the legislation. They're just doing it. Uh, yeah, they're they're just doing it anyway, yeah. um, with the claim that well, Rush is doing it. Yeah, which well, isn't even assured. Now, I think the the danger is probably best illustrated by comparison. Yeah. So um, Laos is the the country that that where the com well that seems to be having the most trouble with it yeah. because uh, Laos is I, I've seen. Uh, statistics that suggest that Laos is the most bombed country in the history of the world. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Like more than, you know, Germany in World War II. Wow. Okay. Um, and that was the U.S. during the, the Indochina War, the Vietnam War. Yeah. Conflict. Conflict. Me. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Wasn't a war. Wasn't a war. <laughs> um, so to this day, so that, let's see, the war ended... We'll say 75 for round number. Well, no, we'll say 73 for round numbers. That way we can yeah. go, you know, 73 to 23. So 50 yeah. years. Yeah. 50 years ago, the war ended. Yeah. Um, to this day, Laos still suffers hundreds of deaths and severe injuries a year as a result of unexploded ordnance yeah. in their country. That's insane. Um, a lot of it is cluster bombs. There's also mines and, and uh, yeah. you know, uh, larger munitions that just didn't go off. But yeah. um, but a lot of it is, is cluster bombs and mines, yeah. these little bomblets, yep. as they call them. Hundreds of deaths and severe injuries a year still, 50 years later. 50 years later. That's, uh, that's remarkable. Yeah. And we already know that Ukraine has been heavily mined yep. um, during this conflict. And now you're talking about spreading who knows how many hundreds or thousands of, of little cluster bomblets yeah. all over the countryside as well. Yeah. Um, there's going to be Just, nothing left of this country by the time oh by the time the U.S. finally permits this conflict to end. Yeah, yeah, it's the truth, man. Like the longer it goes on, the worse it's going to be. Mm -hmm. 
And, uh, and I, I'm just tired of the argument that, well, we can't, you know, we can't concede anything to Russia. Yeah. I'm sorry. The, what, what is your alternative? Yeah. The, I mean, this is what I have to keep asking people. Like, what do you think should happen from here? Yeah. Because the more weapons and so forth that you, that you put into Ukraine for Ukraine to defend itself against Russia and, and Russia is an aggressive actor well, here. There absolutely are. Yeah. But, um, the, the longer this war persists, the more destruction, the more death. Yeah. Like what's your priority to save face over Russia yeah. or to protect human life? Yeah. Well, and I mean, we were the aggressor when we went into Iraq. Yeah. Like, I mean, that's, that's the point I always go back to. Like, I, I hate the what about but like, you have to at least acknowledge it. Like, mm -hmm. you know, we're currently the aggressor in Syria. Yeah. There you go. Like, <laughs> so, um, they don't want us there. Yeah. Hey, you remember, uh, we, we reported on the podcast a few years ago. Um, Iraq actually, uh, through their government, their parliament or have, I think it's parliamentary system that they finally set up there, yeah. um, voted to eject the American military. Yeah. And we were just like, yeah, we're not going anywhere. Yeah. That's <laughs> not, you're going to have to like make us go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good luck with that. <laughs> it hadn't went well so far. Right? <laughs> so, so yeah. yeah. Um, now I, you know, I, I hate to see the aggression be rewarded. Yeah. Too. I mean, like I'm, I'm well, on that's, board that's, with this. That's but, the argument from the other side is that, mm -hmm. you know, well, we can't let, like, if we let him do this, what else can he do? And, and I do, I understand that yeah, argument. I, I can sympathize with that position. Yeah. But at the same time, you have to, you have to negotiate an end to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How, how else does a war end? Yeah. I mean, especially in a situation where, I mean, Ukraine, regardless of what the media tells you, is not, they don't have the upper hand here. No. Like, I mean, I no. know. It's, I, 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 I'm sorry to even laugh at that, but the idea is laughable. It, it is. Like, the, the facts on the ground just don't represent that, mm -hmm. you know, regardless of what the American media says. Yeah. I mean, they, they've got press gangs going all over Ukraine right now where they're rounding up young men and yeah. conscripting them forcibly putting them into the Ukrainian military to fight. Oh, that was the other thing that I heard coming out of this conference that was just, I, I don't know. I don't know how to take this. Tell me what you think. But the argument was that, that Ukraine should be put into to NATO because they have the strongest military in Europe now. <laughs> Um, no, and they're, they're serious. Like that's the mm -hmm. argument is that that their their military has 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 is battle worn, like battle ready. Like they're they're they're, and that that's the reason that they will contribute to NATO because they have they currently have the strongest military in Europe. And I just when I heard these people saying this, I'm like, are you kidding me? Well, like I. I I think if they want to increase the power of NATO by incorporating the strongest military in Europe, yeah. then what they should be doing is inviting Russia. Yeah. <laughs> the strongest military in Europe, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, come on. I, I don't know. It's just, it's, but that's... It's such a farce. It is. Like, I, I don't know. I can't, couldn't get over it. Yeah. Um, I encourage people to like go outside of the mainstream media and start really looking looking for this information. I, yeah. you know, uh, to me, I like, I recommend this blog all the time because I think it's full of great information. I don't always agree with what's going on there, but, um, look at, uh, Bernard's stuff on moon of Alabama.org. Yeah. Moon of Alabama.org is a great resource for this stuff. Cause this guy was a, a former, I think German intelligence officer. Yeah. he, he does a great job. I mean, he posts something almost every day. He does a great job of analyzing available information. He's yeah. got some inside knowledge about military stuff and the, the analyses are great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's pretty convincing. And then you start looking at other kind of off the beaten path people. You start finding a lot of corroboration with what, what he's what, telling what you. he's saying. Yeah. And then over time, I mean, I think I know that a lot of people, we're disagreeing with us when we started talking at the beginning of this about Ukraine didn't have the power to do this, that Russia was going to 
um, going to win this war. Maybe slow and steady, but they're not they're yeah. not going to lose. Yeah. Um, and that you know the Ukrainian military didn't have the power, didn't have the experience, uh, didn't you know just isn't capable of doing this. Well, I, this is it's bearing out now. Yeah. Like oh, it's yeah. getting harder and harder to to hide the fact that what we were claiming all along was correct. Yeah. yeah. Um. Well, and this is a must win for Russia. Like they're all in on this. Oh yeah. Like well, this, Ukraine feels that way too. Well, they do. And I because, think probably NATO does home. as well. I mean, that was one of Mearsheimer's things that why he was saying that this was such a dangerous war. Yeah. Is that everybody sees it as an existential crisis. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so nobody's willing to give up anything. Yeah. He said that there, in fact, his claim is that there cannot be a negotiated settlement to this, which is really frightening. Yeah. Yeah. No, there's, there's definitely some fear in that. Um, and because the, the U S or at least the Biden administration, I, I think the only way that the U S backs down on this is if somebody, if somebody else is elected, yeah. um, president. Yeah. I, in fact, I would say it would almost have to be, uh, a Republican, because I don't think that a, a Democrat president would back down off of the Biden position. Oh, there's really only one other Democrat running, and he's pretty good on Ukraine. Oh yeah, that's true. <laughs> I'm just that's saying true. that's a that, good point. So when when you look at the field, like there is a Democrat out there that can do it. And yeah, you're talking about RFK, J. Right? I am. Yes. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is that I don't think that DeSantis is the guy. No, DeSantis is it, DeSantis is not the guy. So like I've given him kind of a look mm-hmm. wondering like, okay, he's done. He's been so good in Florida. Like maybe this guy, you know, I'm not going to support stay there. I'm not going to support him, but maybe he's worth, you know, looking at as far as he's not like he's, no. he's, he's, he's not it. Like in his, as far as his positions, for a particularly like, like Ukraine, like mm-hmm. he's just not really giving them out because he's going to go the opposite direction of where Trump is. And Trump's already staked his claim. Well, if for no other reason that there, there is, um, there's good evidence to suggest that DeSantis was on board with the, um, the torture programs at Gitmo. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a deal breaker for me. Yeah. Hands down. So, um, of course, I mean, Trump like advocated torturing, yeah. families of terrorists too. So it's not like he's any better on that point, but, yeah. um, but DeSantis would have been in a position to do something about it. And yeah, it seems to have chosen not to. And yeah. in fact, seems to have chosen to support it. Yeah. So no, I'm not definitely not on the DeSantis train. No, me either. Not on the Trump train, not on the DeSantis no. train, not on the no. Biden train. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, if any of the mainstream candidates getting any support from me right now, it's going to be RFKJ. Yeah. Uh, and I probably will support his campaign. Like once we start actually getting into the campaign season, yeah. I will probably throw some money at him. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure I will at some point too, just because mm-hmm. just it, nothing else to having that voice out there. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, I don't agree with a lot of what he says, but yeah. I, I agree with enough of the important stuff. Yeah. Yeah. There's enough important things where he seems to be coming down on the right side. Yeah. Um, and I don't mean right, like right versus left. I mean like the correct side. The correct. Yeah. Exactly. Um, that he's he's worth uh, he's worth supporting to have that voice out there to have people hear what yeah. he's got to say. Yeah. <clears throat> um, even if you think he's a nutcase, I won't yeah. end up voting for him though. I'm pretty well. Yeah. It kind of depends. I mean. <laughs> I don't know, man. Like the it depends on what the LP does, man. Yeah, that's, like they, that's the true. The ball's in their court. Like, yeah, that's true. I mean, I, so I certainly in um, in twenty twenty would have voted for Tulsi Gabbard if she had been the Democrat nominee. Yeah. Oh, I, I think so. Yeah. That would have been the best candidate with a realistic chance of winning. Yeah. Um, and I, I wasn't a huge fan of our uh, the LP's candidate. Yeah. Um. We, I wanted to be, but I just I couldn't do it. Yeah, that. I couldn't get on board with her. Yeah. Um, Joe Jorgensen had, I mean, the best thing that she had for me was that she was Harry Brown's vice presidential candidate once. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that, <laughs> uh, yeah, because I love me some Harry Brown. Yeah. Right. But, um, but, you know, some of the things, I actually met her at the, uh, at the convention, um, at the Whiskey Caucus uh, event. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. She's nice yeah. enough. I mean, like she, you know, but yeah. some of the messaging wasn't good. And and when we were actually like doing the nominations, um, she was fifth of six 
on my list. Really? Yeah. yeah. Wow. So she was at the back of the bus. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, you know, I, I tried to get behind her for a while, and but then some of that messaging was just, it was so wrong. It was just I ended up much. not voting for anybody in 2020, or really? not anybody at the presidential level. Yeah, yeah. So, oh well. Bygones is bygones. Yes. Um, one other uh, quick story, uh, I guess, hopefully quick. Yeah. Um, there's this uh, um, federal level case, uh, Missouri versus Biden, yeah. That is about um, the executive branch ordering uh, private companies uh, and read um, social media companies here um, to suppress counter narrative information. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, they've definitely been doing it. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, this is one of those real dangers. Again, it, it's the, uh, they're, what they're trying to do is get around the, the restrictions of the Bill of Rights, of the First Amendment to the Bill of Rights, about government suppressing speech yeah. by using private companies to do it. Yeah. And, um, and it seems like the judicial system is not having it, but the executive branch is fighting back about this, which creates this like weird situation where there is a Where they have to conflict. admit they've been doing it? Well, it, it, it's even worse than that, I, yeah. actually. Um, yeah, they absolutely have to admit that they've been doing it, but yeah. there's like this conflict between the judicial branch and the executive branch where the executive branch's position is that they should be permitted to do it. Yeah. <laughs> Not just that they've done it. Yeah. Yeah. But that it should be permissible. Yeah. To, um, suppress the speech of people in public forums. Yeah. That that's and I mean even listening to the once again going back to listening to the mainstream media they're pretty open about this about oh what are we going to do to control misinformation like yeah. that's that's always the talk and and it irritates we're coming every, back around to the schools because the answer to that is better education <laughs> yes right well that's just it like mm-hmm. people should have the right to say what they want to say like it's your right to believe them or not yeah. like. Well, the other problem, of course, is that there has been an awful lot of um, information suppressed that has borne out to be correct. Yeah, especially during COVID. Yeah. Um, uh, well, and the Ukraine war stuff, too. I was going to say, but I mean, it, it persists on today, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. Um, now, the the interesting tactic that seems to have been going on here is that the uh, executive branch or the the government generally um, is threatening these companies. And this is what we've always said is the problem, really, is that in the fight between a business and the government, the government wins Yeah. every time. Like, those of you that are out there that are afraid of corporations, you're afraid of corporations because they pay off government to get their way. Yeah. But whenever there's actually a conflict that arises between the business and the government, the government gets their way. Every time. Um, it's not the business that you've got to worry about. Without the support, the coercive power of the government, they have no power over you. Exactly. The only entity that actually has coercive power over you is the government every single time. Yeah. And so what the government's doing in this case is that they're threatening these companies that they'll pull them out in front of Congress and determine whether they're liable for speech that is uh, posted on their platform. Yeah. And, um, and of course, this comes down then to the myth of the rule of law. Yeah. Because strictly speaking, because of the uh, Section 230 protections that they have, they're not liable. I think it's Section 230. It anyway, is, yeah. um, they're not liable for uh, for speech on a public platform. No. Um, and they should Unless be. they moderate it. But yeah. they're being forced to moderate it by the government in <laughs> order to avoid... Be- <laughs> anyway, yeah, they're, it's, they're, it's they're a screwed God. either way they go. Yeah. Um, they can't support the government's position here because then they admit that they're moderating and then they don't have Section 230 protections anymore. Yeah. Um, and at the same time, if they want Section 230 protections, they can't follow what the government does. But then the government has the power to shut them down um, yeah. or to hold them liable anyway. Back again to the myth of the rule of law yeah. is that we know that the the law can be manipulated by the government to apply or not apply to whoever it chooses. Yep. And so... Um, you They're illust- in a catch-22. You illustrated this just a few minutes ago. I was going to say something, but we kind of moved past it uh-huh. with the cluster bombs. Oh, yeah. 
You know, I mean, that they've got laws on the books saying we can't give these things to other countries, but we're just doing it. Like, yeah. you know, it's just words on the paper. Who's going to stop me? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's just it. Um, yeah. So, and, and th- it's the same thing with this, you know, it's just words on the paper. You look like you have some on your mind. Yeah. Um, <laughs> There are times where I think that this whole thing that we're doing here is a complete waste of time. Yeah. 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 Like, uh, you know, I don't know. I guess I'm feeling kind of black pilled right now. Um, that I I was just thinking, okay, we've been doing this for four and a half years, nearly 200 episodes. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like we end up addressing the same topics over and over and over again. The story is different. The news story is different. Like whatever led to us addressing the topic yeah. is different, but the topics just, they keep arising and it, and it's yeah. not getting better. It's getting worse. I mean, there are the, there are some moments where you feel like maybe we're moving a little bit in the right direction. Like some of the Supreme court yeah. um, opinions that, that we offered last week, but on the whole, I think that we're in a worse position now than we were when we started. And then I'm looking Mm -hmm. down at my paper here and I see the name Elliot Abrams. (laughs) And, and it just makes me feel like, like that we're failing because Elliot Abrams, um, was a real popular topic at the early part of this podcast. Now, Elliot Abrams was just recently, like a week ago or so, um, appointed to a, um, uh, it's not an embassy position, but, um, it's, uh, some kind of diplomatic group, like a diplomacy group, uh, executive group, you know, for kind of, I guess, determining the path of, uh, of foreign policy and U S diplomacy in the world. Yeah. Now, Elliot Abrams is a terrible person. He's been around for a really long time. He first really pops up in the Reagan administration where he's down in Nicaragua helping form death squads to, you know, to support or take down whatever government. I I, I don't remember if we were on board with Nicaraguans or we were against them. I think we were against them. So, but it it doesn't matter. Um, The point is that he was working for the U S government to help form death squads, to kill civilians and create terror in Nicaragua back in the eighties. We were talking about him a lot at the beginning of this podcast with the Venezuela thing. Because yes. he was the the special envoy to Venezuela that went down there that was trying to organize the coup against Nicolas Maduro and to uh, place Juan Guaido in power. Yeah, he failed, but that was his role. There was to was create a job. regime change. Yeah, in um in Venezuela, and then uh, at the end of the Trump administration, he appears again um, as an envoy to Iran or to the special representative to Iran or something. I can't remember what his title was. But what his role actually was, was to poison the well before Biden took office um, to prevent Biden from reentering the the, um, JCPOA. Yeah. So he started instituting a bunch of, or he designed, you know, a bunch of new sanctions on Iran to try and create a, a diplomatic rift with Iran at the end of the Trump presidency as if there wasn't enough of a rift already, right. um, but enough to make it impossible for Biden to reenter the JCPOA. Yeah. As it turns out, it doesn't seem like Biden was that interested in reentering the JCPOA. <laughs> yeah. But like I said, his role seems to have been to poison the well and make sure that it didn't happen. Yeah. So now he's been appointed by the Biden administration to this diplomatic position. Yeah. Why? This guy's awful. <laughs> All right. Like, how is this man still, how is he being a, appointed to any kind of diplomatic position? Yeah. He's not Be- a diplomat. Because diplomacy isn't the goal. Yeah. He's a, he's a chaos seeker. That's yeah. what he is. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I look at this and I'm like, this guy, we, we can't get rid of him. Yeah. Like he keeps popping back up and he's terrible every time and it doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. He's part of the permanent, permanent bureaucracy. Yeah, he's, he's, he's been entrenched. a part of, he's a part of every administration in some way or another. And he's doing terrible things every single time. Yeah. And he's still there. Yeah. Regardless of who you voted for. Yeah. And we're still fighting over whether the government can censor uh, American speech in a public forum. We're still fighting over whether we should be at war in a half a dozen countries where we have no business. Yeah. 
you know, we're still spending like crazy. I, I don't know. I, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm <laughs> feeling frustrated with this right now. And, and I guess there's some other things about it too. Is like, uh, like we, I, I don't feel like we built the community here that I kind of had in mind when we started this thing. Yeah. I'm mm. sorry. I'm like breaking <laughs> down here and like really going off the rails, but, yeah. um, and there are some of you that are, that are involved that I hear from really regularly. And I, I yeah. really appreciate that. Yeah. Um, but it, it hasn't, uh, it hasn't become the, I thought that we would see a lot more discussion and debate and involvement and engagement, yeah. um, from our audience. And yeah. I, I try to encourage it whenever I can. And maybe we're doing something wrong there. I don't, I yeah. don't know. Yeah. Um, but it hasn't panned out to be what I wanted. And I put a lot of time into this. Yeah. And I think I need a break. Yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, there's other things that I want to do. I spend a lot of time reading to prepare for this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I don't know right now. I'm not, I'm not seeing the percentage, I guess. Yeah. In it. And I want to do yeah. some other things. I think we're going to yeah. take a week off. Okay. I don't know. If that's what you want to do. Yeah. Figure some things out. Let's, let's take a week off. Um, well, you have to, you have to bear in mind, like, I mean, there's tons of good podcasts out there and none of them are changing the world. Like the, the world is what it's going to be. I mean, it's, it's depressing looking at it like, you know, cause I mean, it's, yeah, uh, but you've got to bear in mind, like, it, it's just not, like I say, we're, it, it's going to be what it's going to be. But people still need to hear the truth. Well, all right, all of you out there, you tell me. I'm Michael at the Liberty Mike. Of right. course, you can, you know, make comments on Facebook and YouTube and Podbean as well. Like, do you find this valuable? Yeah. Is this valuable to you? If it's valuable yeah. to you, then, like, I, I've mostly enjoyed doing this. Yeah. I, I love it. I think yeah. it's fun. Well, you don't spend as much time preparing for it as I do. <laughs> There's something to that. I have I have limited time. Like I want to read the Foundation series. Yeah. Ice cast them off. I like that I want awesome. to read the Foundation series. It's like six books. And I, I just don't I like I look at it all the time and I'm like, well, no. I gotta read you know, management of savagery about the Iraq war, or I got to read Scott and Horton's new book, or I need to read some economic stuff. Yeah. Um, or I'm reading pedagogy of the oppressed, uh, yeah. by, uh, Paulo Freire right now, yeah. um, which actually has more for libertarians in it than I would have guessed. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, there's some, uh, I don't know. There's some definitions where we would disagree, <laughs> I guess, which makes it kind of a, an issue. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's actually far more libertarian than I would have guessed since it's like this socialist handbook kind of thing. Um, but anyway, like this is, this is what I do with my free time. And then of course I'm like keeping up with news, yeah. like reading all these articles all over anti-war every week, uh, you know, all over the mainstream news, keep up with moon of Alabama because this stuff is great. You know, like there's, yeah. I don't know. I need I need at least a little break. Break is good. All right. So we won't be back next week. All right. We'll be back the week after with a plan. With a plan to take over the world. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. So um anyway, let me hear from you. Like this would actually make a huge difference to me yeah. to hear from our audience that Yeah that this is valuable to you. Yeah. So, um, well, that was kind of a downer. Sorry. Yeah. I was trying to think of something to pick us back up for the end, but I got nothing, man. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Well, you, the audience has the opportunity to pick us back up. All right. There you go. Um, and so we'll be back in two weeks and, uh, and we'll figure out what we're doing from there. In the meantime, you can follow us on Facebook, subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, Podbean. Um, like and share, tell your friends, comment, subscribe. Uh, leave me some comments. You can always email me at michael at the Um, And do, 
Yeah. <laughs> I, I really, I mean, yeah. I, it would be nice to hear from people that I haven't heard from before. Yeah. Um, and, you know, let us know that we're providing something to you that you want. Yeah. Make it an impact. Yeah. Yeah. On some it, level. Yeah. Sometimes you just need to know that you're doing something. Yeah. Yeah. And this may again be back around that I've only had like six hours of sleep in four days. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Or something else. Who knows? Um, but uh, yeah, we'll be back in a couple of weeks when we hopefully get this right. <laughs> <laughs> in the meantime, try to stay free. Life's short. Live free. Ciao. Later.